Welcome to the Visible Risk Masterclass series on cyber risk quantification. You may have been hearing a lot about cyber risk quantification or CRQ lately, and are wondering how you can incorporate that into your organization. In this five-part series, we're gonna be talking about how organizations can build their own programs, optimize them, and avoid common pitfalls in deploying cyber risk quantification in their organizations. My name is Jack Freund, and I'm gonna take you through this series. In this first lesson, we're going to be talking about the critical ingredients to building a CRQ program. An important question to ask is, what is CRQ? There is no commonly accepted definition for what it is. However, a reasonably good approximation of what it is, is an application of rigorous statistical methods to quantify the impact and frequency of cybersecurity. There are two elements in that statement to talk about risk generally, how often bad things happen, and when they do, how bad are they likely to be. CRQ gives you the opportunity to measure those two elements to build a better risk program in your organization. It does this through applying statistical methods or actuarial grade methodologies to forecast what we think loss is going to look like. So it includes things like value at risk, Monte Carlo simulations, and stress testing techniques in place by operational risk teams at financial services companies. A lot of organizations have these precursor things that allow them to better understand the need for cybersecurity risk quantification. Typically, organizations have a number of different inputs into what the priority should be for what they need to do. They have their own assessment functions that, I that identify broken things and missing controls. They have an internal audit function that overlays them that talks about additional broken things and missing controls. And they have regulators that do the same thing. All of these things in concert provide a list of too many high-risk things. And when everything's important, nothing's important. CRQ gives you the tools to be able to appropriately prioritize amongst lists of high-risk things. With an ever-increasing complexity of our operating environments through things like cloud-native organizations, migrations to the cloud for legacy organizations, work from home, zero-trust networks, and the increasing use of consumer technology in your workplace. The cybersecurity landscape for controls gets bigger and bigger all the time. Add to that an increasing awareness of regulators and oversight, where they're interested in how you're managing cybersecurity well and the priorities that you're taking and why. And thirdly, the consumers themselves, your customers, want to make sure that you're managing cybersecurity risks to the best of your possible ability. CRQ allows you to prioritize amongst all the important things you need to do. They'll give you a punch list on what the most important things are to move the needle to give you the best opportunity for avoiding cyber losses. So let's take a look at the five elements of effective CRQ. You need to have the appropriate amount of data. That data needs to be effectively simulated. And the outputs of those simulations need to be applied to a series of verbal risk labels that drive priority in your organization. The entirety of your CRQ program needs to have standards integration to ensure that you're on solid foundations. And finally, the reporting out is necessary to make sure that your organizational executives and boards of directors can take the appropriate actions to drive change in your organization. Let's take a look at data. This is the first thing that a lot of organizations struggle with when they're building their CRQ programs. The most important thing to recognize is that the types of data that you can use vary, and that risk itself is a measure of a future state. These forecasts about what could come to pass in the future are necessarily imprecise. They have variability baked into them. So we have to express data as an input into our CRQ models that likewise allows us to express the uncertainty we have about the future. So one of the best places to get data is in your actual organization. You may maintain a list of cybersecurity incidents and losses and associated amounts of activity that go with that. They may be labeled and categorized. This gives you the opportunity to build a range of what the future might look like based upon what has happened in the past. Likewise, industry reports put together by a lot of cybersecurity operations teams, researchers, and industry vendors it gives you the opportunity to see better what the rest of the landscape for cybersecurity looks like. Those reports coupled with your own data can give you a much wider view of what a possible outcome could look like. Some organizations and some industries participate in peer data sharing where they anonymously share data about what losses happened, 
different types of threats. These can further feed your own data sets around uh, what those losses could look like if you were to do the same thing. There are also data aggregation services that compile public and private cyber insurance claims data and SEC filings about potential losses due to cybersecurity incidents. The last thing, and where a lot of the CRQ operations teams start, is with SME elicitation. The subject matter experts in your organization can help you better, better establish what a list of potential losses could look like. Begin with a series of scenarios, take those scenarios and walk them around to different parts of your organization. Understand what the chief privacy officer thinks of it. If this event were to occur, what types of events would then kick off from their perspective? Would you have to hire outside counsel? Would you have to hire a PR firm to help you manage these kind of things? What is that going to cost? Talk to heads of business and understand if this incident were to occur, how many customers would we lose? How much money do you think, how much revenue and money would we lose and have to spend in order to regain those customers or keep them? And if we lost them, what would that cost us? By connecting better with the different parts of the business, you can better understand what losses look like for your organization and use that data in the appropriate ranges and input them into a CRQ simulation. The simulation methods that we use in cyber risk quantification are an important part of this. Again, I mentioned we're talking about a forecast of things that could happen in the future. So we have to use the appropriate statistical tools to model what that potential future looks like. The gold standard for this is using Monte Carlo simulations. What Monte Carlo does is take those range-based data estimates that we have, randomly pick values off of them, and then build another curve based upon those outputs. It does this thousands of times. So, so what you end up with is a curve of potential outputs of things that may come to pass. This allows us to forecast what a very bad day might look like and what a most likely day would look like. These simulations are important and the way that we do this is important because a lot of organizations have oversight over their financial models called model risk management. These organizations provide a sort of audit over the types of models that organizations use and serve to answer the meta question of what's the risk that our risk models are bad. These types of models have been proven to be effective at managing the potential outcomes of future events. Once we have those outcomes and we understand what a most likely value looks like compared to what a worst case value looks like, it's important then to codify that in the verbal risk labels that we use. I said something at the beginning about how oftentimes these risk labels get overused when everything's important, nothing's important. People use these labels because they want them to drive action in the organization. But research has shown that when people use these different words, probable, likely, high, medium, definitely, we interpret them very, very differently. When people were asked to provide quantitative ranges for what they thought those words meant, they were all over the board. This is why appropriately defining the risk labels that you're using with quantified values, in other words, when somebody says something's high risk, it means $5 million worth of potential losses in the next 18 months, drives specific action in the organization. And we understand very specifically why. Across the whole organization, we can standardize on these types of labels so that when your internal audit functions, your cybersecurity team, and others begin to say something is high risk, we know it's driving a specific action in the organization. This is important to summarize for executive management and other decision makers what are the most important things and the potential losses that are associated with them. In all the things that we do in CRQ program building, we have to make sure that there's an appropriate amount of standards integration. You don't want to be an avant-garde organization doing something that's not supported by what industry experts have said is, is important. The good news is I've read all of the cybersecurity standards and I can tell you none of them say that you cannot do quantitative risk management. In fact, many of the popular ones such as NIST CSF and ISO, talk about the ability of organizations to do cyber risk management and risk assessments in a qualitative way or a quantitative way. So you're on a rock solid foundation immediately by adopting a CRQ program. And it's in support of these types of programs that you can begin to build out a larger cyber risk function. The other important thing about standards integration is you don't wanna choose a CRQ methodology that eschews or ignores the work of countless cybersecurity experts in building these standards. Indeed, the control tests that you're doing should feed into, should map to all of these important security standards that exist in the industry. 
and then those should map into quantitative values in your CRQ model. This end-to-end -end mapping gives you a greater connection between the important things that you have to do from a security standard perspective and the compliance programs that are wrapped, that are wrapped around those. And then the CRQ values at the other end to give you the opportunity to better manage good decision making in your organization. Once you've completed these types of assessments and build out the CRQ model, you have to report it up to management. One of the tricky things about this is because of the statistical nature of what we're putting together, it can be very complex. We want to make sure that the CRQ methodologies that we use allow us to pick simple values to drive specific behaviors in the organization. So for example, I mentioned earlier, picking a value at the top of that curve is the most likely outcome and value at the end of the curve as something that is a very bad day. Using terms like that and using those types of values makes it very easy for organizations to understand what they should be doing. In this example here on the screen, uh, you can see where we've established three different high level scenarios that are important for organizations to manage against. Business interruption, data disclosure, fraud, a particular value taken off that curve, in this case, the most likely value, and the constituent losses that we think comprise that type of value. How much money we think we're gonna lose in revenue, what our fines look like, what our expenses look like. This is a simplistic view that allows organizations to better understand what loss exposure looks like. And it enables additional types of management like the slide on this next page here that tells us a little bit more about a risk appetite function. Many organizations have established a risk appetite value such as we don't accept high risk things, but what is high risk? We've already established that a lot of organizations uh, that use verbal risk labels alone are actually not communicating very well because the interpretation of those values varies from person to person. So using a quantitative risk appetite statement like this gives us a very specific value. And CRQ enables this. We can say very specifically, this type of event was going to cost us $200 million. Is that acceptable? Is that too much, too little? We can begin to adjust those thresholds in response to what executives and the board of directors thinks is an appropriate amount. For values that exceed that, we can begin managing to that and identifying the controls that we've mapped back through our standards to the important things that we think organizations need to do to control potential losses. You can round this out with values at the bottom, such as a limit, that's sort of an early warning indicator, and a value at the top that says, this is the most that our organization could handle if something bad were to come to pass. The culmination of these types of reports gives organizations the ability to better manage cybersecurity risk in a quantitative manner. Join me on the next session where we'll talk a little bit about how to begin doing CRQ immediately in your organization.